It's Staycation Destinations on Family Life. All of our trips are to fun places, but that is literally true about today's stop. Yes, it's game time. Each week, all summer long, we map out a unique opportunity for you to discover somewhere unique in our two states, fairly close to home and fairly affordable. I'm Greg Gillespie, and today our staycation destinations take you to the legacy of Margaret Woodbury Strong in her hometown of Rochester. Hi, I'm Shane Reinwald, and I'm the Senior Director of Public Relations at the Strong National Museum of Play in Rochester, New York. Give us an overview of the new and exciting things that are happening as you've just been through your expansion. So the Strong, uh, we are the only museum in the world dedicated to the study of play. And now we have added to that already a massive building. It was 275,000 square feet. We just opened at the end of June an exciting 90,000 square foot expansion, which really is looking at what's next in play. So it's looking at electronic games and how they've really changed the way that people play and communicate and connect with each other across geographic boundaries. And we've also added with the expansion, a new outdoor play area. It's our Hasbro game park. So think of all the favorite board games from your childhood brought to life. So giant candy canes from Candyland, the spinner from the game of life that you can actually ride, giant Jenga blocks to climb over, Um, just something really super fun. And one of the first times that we've done something outdoors as a museum. Now, there are a lot of different kinds of museums, those that do history and those that do science and those that do art. But what is special about having a museum designated for play? It's really completely unique. And in a sense, it's almost two museums in one. So we get to have a little bit of all of it. So we are at our core, an American History Museum. So we collect and display the artifacts of play. So we have an original Monopoly prototype that folks can see some of the earliest electronic games and pinball machines that you can come down and take a look at and learn about their history and what they meant and um, sort of how they connected to the culture of any specific decade from the last few centuries. But you can't be a play museum and just show people play objects. So we're also a super family friendly museum, have a lot of aspects that people might traditionally associate with a children's museum. So not only can you look at all of these cool things, then you can go and play in a giant spaceship or a giant dollhouse or go see statues of your favorite superheroes and learn about how they inspire play. We have a giant pop-up storybook. So really, it takes both of those worlds, which makes it a super multi-generational kind of experience as well. The grandparents can talk about the things that they played with when they were a kid and showcase those and, and the parents as well. And then the kids can go and actually get hands-on with things that are similar. We're talking with Shane Reinwald at the Strong Museum of Play. Your previous answer just leads right into the next question I wanted to ask. Is there a typical kind of museum goer who comes and visits the Museum of Play? Are there categories of groups? Who, Who enjoys being there? Yeah, so it really is a little bit of everyone. We certainly have lots of families lots for kids to do and play and learn as they experience the museum. But we have a lot of adults that come as well. We have people that are really into electronic games and comic books and things like that. Grandparents that often come and bring bring the grandkids. It's also really become a, a good date spot for people as well. So if you think of those first dates that sometimes can be a little bit awkward, you're not sure what to talk about. Well, here you come, there's plenty to talk about. There's plenty to remember. So we have folks of all ages and all scopes. How many people come to your museum in a given year or week by week? Yeah, so it's uh, this year we're on pace to be above 700,000 folks, which will be the highest in the museum's history. Our previous high was about 600,000. But given the expansion, the additional 90,000 square feet um, and interest from folks in coming out to see what's new. And we've really been starting to attract people from more of a four or five hour drive market as well. So if you think from Rochester, that's up into Toronto, out to Cleveland, down to Pittsburgh, with the added space, with everything going on here. And I think with getting the word out about the uniqueness of this place, there aren't other cities that have dedicated museums of play. We've really been able to draw people from all over. Tell us about the strong part of your name and the history. The name The Strong comes from Margaret Woodbury Strong. She was the museum founder, the museum benefactor. She was the only child of a very wealthy family here in the Rochester area. 
They were actually the earliest and single largest shareholders in Eastman Kodak stock. So as you can imagine, when Eastman Kodak became a powerhouse, they went from rich to fantastically wealthy. And that afforded her as a child all sorts of opportunities to travel the world. And that's where she fell in love with collecting. And she really loved to collect dolls, miniatures, play-related items. And she did collect a little bit of everything as well. But she would invite people into her house to see what she had collected. And she sort of called it her own personal museum. Um, she passed away in 1969, and she left the bulk of what she had collected and the bulk of her money and not much more of a roadmap other than I would like a formal museum. And at that time, the idea of doing something around play or focusing on the, the dolls and toys that she had collected was mostly unheard of. So when the museum opened in 1982, it was all about how all of those items had been mass produced and what industrialization meant to everyday life, which... As you can imagine, people came, they saw that once, they were never seen again. So the museum's gone through a few iterations. And then in the early 2000s, we got back to really what the core of what made Margaret Woodbury strong tick. It was those dolls, it was those toys. And there is an academic thread there in the museum world to tie it together. And play is a serious subject. And now it's getting its due as a serious topic, as something that's incredibly important, not only for kids, but for adults alike. Now, in your role, you spend a lot of time doing a lot of different things, but are there particular parts of the Strong Museum or different exhibits that you personally enjoy going over and taking a look at if you've got a little free time? I do. I actually have a four-year-old, so it's fun to bring him and see it through his eyes and not necessarily just see it through the eyes of somebody that works here. But some of my personal favorite areas, I really like what we're doing with electronic games and contextualizing those and putting those into the play history. So there's a lot of those moments just walking through where it's like, oh, I didn't know we had that. That's something I had as a kid. Oh, I haven't played this game in 20 years. Let's see if I'm still good at it and still have the knack for it. So I really love those sort of nostalgia polls. And you see that with guests throughout the museum. One of my favorite things to hear is people telling their kids or their grandkids those stories. Oh, I had one just like that when I was a kid, or the neighbor kid got one of those and my parents wouldn't buy it for me. And 30, 40, 50 years later, I still have emotion over that. And that I think is the power of toys and play is that somebody can see something that they haven't seen in 50 years and they're instantly transported. They're instantly a kid again. Those emotions come back. And then to have people be able to share those is it's something special. Isn't that the power of personal stories? That is. Shane Reinwald coordinates public relations for the Strong Museum of Play in downtown Rochester. The museum is open from 10 to 5 every day and later on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday evenings. As we bump into Labor Day and the end of the summer, this completes our tour of New York and Pennsylvania tourist sites, but we do have one other stop to make. We'll do that with a special program Monday at noon, reviewing some of these great stops that we've made all this year and take you to a new location in eastern Pennsylvania. That's Monday at noon, our Labor Day special for staycation destinations. Also check out our website where you can relive all of our conversations, not only from this summer, but from past years too. And check out our side trip suggestions with other unique locations listed each week on our website. Thanks for joining us for staycation destinations throughout the summer of 2023. I'm Greg Gillespie. We'll talk Labor Day. Buckle up and enjoy your journeys. We'll be right back.